What is the worst thing that could happen if we would stop trusting science? Think about that. Well, as we all know, science is incredibly powerful to, uh, to change our societies. Simply take a look at the technology around you or listen to the many TED Talks about new inventions. But in this era of communication, there's one major factor that could prevent the technology from making an impact into society. And this is science communication. Bad science communication. Let me give you an example. Vaccines are among the most safe and mostly tes most tested medical products that we use today. They have saved millions of lives over the past decades. However, there are still a significant number of people who mistrust their safety and therefore refuse to administer them. And this can lead to dangerous consequences for all of us. In 2008, a young boy in Ukraine died short after he received his vaccination. And immediately, the media massively reported about a vaccine-caused death. And consequently, more and more Ukrainian peoples stopped to take their vaccines. Even though the United Nations had clearly reported that, the, that his death had nothing to do with the vaccination, those media reports are still influencing the public response today. And now, for the first time since 2010, polio has made another comeback in Europe, in Ukraine. This year, two children there uh, got infected with polio and are now paralyzed for life because there's no cure. And this is just the beginning. As we speak, scientific knowledge is generated faster than ever. The global scientific output doubles roughly every nine years. And we need this science as a, as, a, as a way to find solutions for all the challenges that we're facing now or in the near future, from bacterial resistance against, against antibiotics to global warming or food scarcity. But finding a technical solution is not the only challenge. To make it work, we have to build bridges. Bridges between different disciplines, cultures, generations, science, and society. Any successful innovation in the world is the, is the effort of many different people working together. And if we don't manage to bring all the different pieces together, innovation is simply not going to work. Well, I first started to realize this when, a few years ago, when I participated in the international science competition for synthetic biology, called iGEM and when I was an undergrad. And this competition invites students from anywhere in the world to come up with a genetically, uh, genetically engineered uh, organism, but with a useful function for society. And apart from the scientific work that they have to do, they're also stimulated to get out there and to talk about what they are doing with other people, or to collaborate with, with different disciplines. And, and short after, I, I, I began to see the, the huge gap between what I knew about biology and what other people understood who are not spending their weekends pipetting in the lab. And I got some funny questions like, yeah, but Nadine, how on earth do you cut a piece of DNA? I wonder if anyone in the audience knows who's not a, not a biologist. Uh, like, do you, do you look under the microscope and do you have mini scissors to cut it? And I can tell you that it's close, but it's not really the way it's going to work. But anyway, I love these kind of questions, because explaining science is a real passion of mine. But the thing that worried me here was the way that we talked about biology in my own field, where we talked about gene therapy or new ways of producing biofuels and drug molecules as life-saving solutions, did not always resemble the way everyone in society thought about these things. And during the many interactions I had with a variety of people, young, old, different backgrounds, I found myself walking on a very thin line sometimes between science and efficacy. And before I knew it, I was confronted with that three-letter word that scares the hell out of a lot of people. G-M-O. Or as we say in France here, 
OGM. Yeah, and with every technology, there are, there are both benefits and risks. And so, there's, no, there's not one answer to the question whether genetically, or genetically modified organisms are good or bad. And it's so important to have inclusive conversations together. So it really made me think. And uh, after my bachelor's, I decided to start a company together with one of my teammates from that competition uh, to communicate about what was going on in the life sciences and what society could expect from it. For the past four years, I had, uh, I had the pleasure to work with, with artists, designers, to, to let them think about their role in the emerging technology of synthetic biology. I organized science debates, uh, or set up uh, workshops about science in museums. And what I learned is that developing skills for science communication is not so easy. It takes a lot of time and practice. And generally speaking, science communication is not a standard element uh, that you will learn when you sign up to become a scientist. You know, as a scientist, you're, you're trained to speak in scientific language and to present your work for your peers or to write for scientific journals with very specific guidelines. But to communicate to the media, or how to engage in a constructive dialogue with non-scientific people, this is typically not part of the deal. And <coughs> so what, what I would like to propose is not to embed some sort of theoretical course about science communication into the science curriculum of students, but rather I think a real difference can be made if, if educational institutes would provide more opportunities or join with existing initiatives that allow young scientists and students to engage more with people outside of the university borders. If you look at the tip, of not only will, this, um, uh, will these experience help to develop skills that benefit society, they will definitely also be benefit the scientists that we raise. If we now look at the, the, the typical career path for a scientist, on the way you'll become more and more uh, specialized in a certain discipline or sub-discipline. And although this brings important opportunities to discover something novel, the other side is that the more specialized you become, the more easy you disconnect from people outside of your field. And so being a good communicator is crucial for collaborations between disciplines that are so important to develop something new, uh, but also to provide different perspectives to a certain problem. We live in a time where, science and so where there, there are no real clear lines between science and society. We are as interrelated and interdependent as the organs in our body that keeps, keep us alive. But for science to make a real impact, communication is key. So perhaps it's time for a new social contract between the scientific community and the general public. One that values a constructive dialogue towards creation and innovation. What we also have to accept in such a contract is the fact that nothing in science is 100% guaranteed. No knowledge or theory is final. So we have to do it with, with the best assumptions we have to make the best possible choices. But I believe we can live with that uncertainty, and I hope that we, can, we, we allow ourselves to not overpressure the expectation that science is always right. But I would like to ask each one of you to engage in the increasing number of opportunities that are out there for citizens to contribute to science and for scientists to society. So join me in this new social contract where together we can amplify the light to illuminate the darkness. Thank you.